Hey, welcome to this Haftarah called Mishpatim. We're in Jeremiah 34, verses 8 through 22, and then we jump back a little bit to chapter 33, verse 25 and 26. Now, it seems like this Haftarah message this week pretty much um, brings home God's message through Jeremiah just why the Israelites deserved God's course correction and the course correction in the way of the destruction of the temple, Jerusalem, and then the dispersion, specifically of Judah right now, right? So what Jeremiah is trying to get across is this warning for them to mend their ways so that they can stay in God's will because staying in God's will is the only way to receive the health and the well-being that being in his will gives us. We don't get that any other way, right? Uh, Because the truth of the matter is God created us and designed us um, and designed for us a plan of blessing, right, when we live in his kingdom ways. So we're not designed to live contrary to our blueprints, so to speak, right? We're not designed to live contrary to our, what I call the manufacturer specifications. And when we live contrary to that, why do we think that we still have the manufacturer's blessings, right? Um, An analogy I like to give, even though I'm not mechanically inclined, is, a car engine that would use vegetable oil to run on, well, we know that's not going to get very far, right? Because it's not designed to run that way. Well, so too, we're not designed to run any way but God's way. We're not designed to run, for example, the way of the nations, right? That's that vegetable oil to us. Now, the story of the Haftarah, that will take place a couple of years before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And I know I've shared this before um, a couple of times in in these lessons, but it, it bears repeating. You know, today, we don't really understand the significance of this destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and how devastating that would be to the original audience because we're so far removed from temple life. So it bears repeating that the temple was the epicenter of the meeting place between heaven and earth, that portal, if you will, of connection with God. You know, our father told us, build me a sanctuary, right? That was his longing for us. That was his bid for connection to us, right? Think about it. The creator of everything that we know calls out to us to come near. And that was symbolized in the temple. And because he and we are fundamentally different, we do need to come near to him according to safe protocols that he has lovingly told us about. That's Torah, right? So to destroy this portal is is kind of the same thing as saying, you know what, um, let's you and I take a break, right? That's devastating. Which, as I mentioned in an earlier um, Haftarah lesson. That's why these Haftaras always need to end on a positive note, promising that in the future we need to we need to see other people. No, taking a break, uh, that that's over, right? So if you haven't watched the Haftarah called Shemot, make sure that you do because um, that kind of gives you the context of of what I'm talking about about why these Haftaras always need to end on um, a more positive note. So in this Haftarah, God uses Jeremiah to remind the people, I've made a covenant with your fathers on the day that I took them out of Egypt, out of slavery. And then he goes on to explain um, that 
what the people agreed to are very specific parameters when it comes to indentured servants. And that's the tie-in with this week's Torah portion, Mishpatim, because the Torah portion just starts out um, discussing the laws pertaining to Jewish slaves. So how in the ancient world did someone end up a slave? Um, very interesting. A poor person could sell himself into servitude as a last-ditch effort to survive. And it was specifically designed, uh, this ability to sell oneself was designed to keep that person's dignity intact. Okay, now remember that. Um, the other reason would be a person who was caught stealing um, and had no way to pay back the value of what they stole, stole uh, they could be in this slavery situation in order to pay the debt back. That's it. And one of the parameters was that this relationship was to be no more than six years. In the seventh year, they were to go free, completely free. And if the jubilee occurred first before that, um, that this, the six years, then that would be the year that they would be released, 100% completely released. And the other thing to keep in mind is that when this person was released, they were sent out by the one that they, that, um, that they had served, they would be sent out with enough provisions to start over anew, okay? Very specific. Um, so yes, the Torah allows Israelites to take fellow Israelites as servants, but this is never by force. Uh, they could never be sold at an auction. If you, yeah. Um, in fact, in the Torah portion this week, it says that a kidnapper, and it's using kidnapper in this sense, is to be put to death. You can't just take somebody and make them a slave. And the Torah portion spells out um, other specifics so as not to oppress the person who's in this servitude position, and in particular female slaves. Okay. So what's happening in the Haftarah is that um, Judah's king, Zedekiah, was afraid that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, um, he was afraid of this king because the king was already beginning the besieging of Jerusalem. Okay, And the attack of Nebuchadnezzar on Jerusalem against Judah. This was seen as a punishment for Judah's failure to follow the Torah's instructions concerning caring for the poor and observing God's Sabbaths. All right. So perhaps Judah's king Zedekiah um, did what he did in order to um, to sort of stave off God's judgment, but he. Um, made the slave owners um, make a covenant that they would release their slaves immediately. Okay, whether it was year, in some cases it was year 17 and they should have been released already, and maybe in some cases it was year two, but he said we're going to release all immediately, which they did. And what's interesting is that there actually was a reprieve from this onslaught from Babylon during this time. But then comes like the double crime, okay? Now that Babylon was off their backs, because Babylon at this particular time turned their, their attention away from Jerusalem and on to Egypt for a time, right? So there was no longer that pressure from Babylon and the slave owners took their slaves back. Okay, now here's the thing, the, the men and the women had been legally freed. 
So taking them back was what? Was kidnapping. And it was at this point that God delivered this prophetic message through Jeremiah, reminding the people of their covenant that they made concerning slaves, not only that they made with him, Sinai, but also this more recent covenant that they had just made with King Zedekiah to release the slaves. So God's answer to this um, double treachery was to say, you didn't proclaim freedom to your fellow man and woman, so I'm going to free you from my protection. And when God freed them from his protection, they became vulnerable to the oppression of the Babylonians, who in fact did come back to finish the job a year or two later. This is a heavy Haftarah. Anytime slavery comes up in Torah, it's heavy. Because, um, you know, there's so many potential abuses, even within biblical slavery, that I think everybody wants to ask, how come God didn't just outright outlaw slavery completely? That's got to be a discussion for another time, or we can talk about it in the comments. Um, You know, the economics of the time were different from what we have today. Um, Biblical slavery was intended as a last chance effort to help a fellow man. And I do know that I can't look back on the abuses of slavery in our own recent history and then try to read that back into the system that God set up to help the poor person get back on their feet. But it's complicated. It's complicated. And I don't know why God didn't just outlaw it completely. This Haftarah, like I said, is heavy for me. And it's heavy because it's inconceivable to me that one human would oppress and subjugate another in the ways that some have done. And it goes back to what I was saying in the beginning. God created us and designed a plan of blessing for us when we live in his kingdom ways. And we weren't designed to live contrary to our blueprint. And I think the reason I'm so passionate about Torah study and about digging into these prophets' warnings it's not to guarantee a get out of get out of hell card. But it's so that life on earth now, today, tomorrow, isn't a hell for myself or a hell that I'm imposing on other people. If you've taken my Hebrew idiom course, then you know that to enter or to receive God's kingdom means that you enthrone God as your king and you commit yourself to be a part of his kingdom, so to speak, which means to do his will, right? That's Malchut Shemaim, kingdom of heaven. And when Yeshua references the kingdom of heaven in the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking about how to aim to do God's will as members of his kingdom. You know, follow his blueprint, right? Follow his factory specifications. Don't put into your car the things that aren't going to make it go according to its purpose. So when one enters the kingdom of heaven, one becomes a partner with God. So it makes sense that if one is wanting to live contrary to that, especially when it comes to oppressing other people, that's the person saying, I don't want to live, I don't don't want to be a partner with you, God. So of course, destruction of the temple would be the result of that. Because that's God saying, let's take a pause from our relationship for a minute, right? 
Because our purpose, why we're here, is to work with God, right? That relationship. And to spread redemption, which is the opposite of oppression, to spread redemption throughout our hurting world. The original meaning of kingdom of heaven is that God's will reigns on this earth today, right now. So as disciples of Yeshua, we can have a taste of God's reign now when we follow his principles. And so because we're his ambassadors, we're his partners, we have this beautiful work to do in the here and in the now. So I'm thinking during this week, as you study the Haftorah and the Torah portion, prayerfully ask God where he wants you to be a redeeming factor in eliminating the oppression that you see that's human on human. See where he... um, See where maybe you unwittingly are perpetuating some things. See where he wants you to take a stand against it. But just have this, have this in your, uh, the forefront of your mind this week. Ask God to speak to you about these issues. Okay. So that's the lesson that I wanted to bring you in this Haftarah. And I will see you next week.